Hello class, it's Ms. Augustine. So we're ready to begin um, the last section of chapter 13, which is chapter 13.3, and that deals with electrons and light. So in this part of the chapter, we talk about light and atomic spectra. So in the late 1600s, early 1700s, Isaac Newton, you remember him, the gravity guy, thought that light consisted of particles. But by about 1900, most scientists believed that light was made up of waves. And according to the wave model, light consists of electromagnetic waves. So when I say electromagnetic radiation, I'm referring to the form of energy that exhibits wave-like behavior as it travels through space. And when we refer to the electromagnetic spectrum, we're talking about all the forms of electromagnetic radiation in our universe. And the speed of all electromagnetic radiation in our universe is constant. It travels at a constant speed. And that speed, which is referred to as the speed of light, has a very large number. It's 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. And notice the unit is meters per second, meters being how far it goes per second. So what we're saying here that light travels at a rate of 3 times 10 to the 8th meters in a given second. So when we're talking about light, and here when I refer to light I mean all of the light in our universe, we're talking about waves. So if you've never seen a uh, description of a wave, and perhaps in math class you have, when we talk about a wave, we talk about there being specific parts to a wave. So we talk about the wave having a crest and a trough, and the crest is the part that's above the origin, so this line would represent the origin, and the trough, you think of a watering trough where horses go to drink, so it will fill this up with water, but again, the part that is below the origin is considered the trough. The length of a wave is defined as the distance from one crest to the next crest, and the amplitude is how high or the distance a wave is, the top of a wave is from the origin. So the height of a wave is its amplitude, the wavelength is distance for, from crest to crest or one complete wave cycle to take place. And we'll talk about one more measurement of a wave and that's the frequency. And the frequency measures how many of these complete cycles pass a given point per second. So again, properties of waves. The amplitude is defined as the height of the wave. The wavelength is the distance of one wave. And the frequency is the number of complete wave cycles that pass a point per unit time. So frequency and wavelength are found to be inversely related. So um, the longer a wave is, the shorter its frequency, the greater the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So it's an inverse relationship. So the speed of light, where light refers to the electromagnetic spectrum, we said is a constant, and C is the unit that we use for the speed of light, and C is what I said on the previous slide, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. The frequency, we use um, the Greek letter nu for frequency, and frequency, we said, is how many um, waves pass a point per second, and the unit that we use for it is called the hertz. It's abbreviated HZ, or one over seconds. So again, it's cycles per second. So according to this wave model of light, it was found that C, the speed of light, is equal to wavelength, and we're going to use another funny Greek letter here. We use the Greek letter lambda for wavelength times frequency, and that is the Greek letter nu. So C, the speed of light in meters per second, is equal to lambda, the wavelength, and length is measured in meters, and 
frequency, the Greek letter nu, is in hertz or one over seconds. And again, the speed of light is a constant and it's always going to be 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. So later on in this unit you'll see that since we know C, the speed of light, because it's a constant, it never changes. If we know its wavelength, we can calculate its frequency. And if we know its frequency, we can calculate its wavelength. So now here, this slide is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the electromagnetic spectrum in our, univer in our universe goes from everything from gamma rays, which are the highest energy, and the smallest wavelength, and you'll see here there's the smallest wavelength, um, on out to uh, AM radio, which is the longest wavelength, and that would be corresponding to the lowest energy and the lowest frequency. Now notice there's this little sliver right here in the center, and this little sliver is the visible region of light. So in the grand scheme of things, when you look at the entire electromagnetic spectrum, there's actually very little light that we can perceive with our eyes, the so-called visible region. And that visible region goes through our rainbow of colors. So red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So again, the region that we can actually see, the visible region of light, is pretty small. And it goes roughly from 400 to about 800 nanometers, nanometers being 10 to the minus 9 meters. So sunlight that we see every day consists of a continuous range of wavelengths and frequencies. A prism separates sunlight into a spectrum of colors. So if you've ever had a chandelier or played with a, um, with a prism at the junior high, you know that you can aim light at it and you get a rainbow. And each of those colors of the rainbow has associated with it a specific wavelength and frequency. Red is the lowest frequency with the longest wavelength. So now we have to talk about the particle description of light because in the uh, early 1900s there were people who believed that light was a wave and there were people emerging who believed that light behaved like particles. So um, in the early 1900s Max Planck, and here's his picture, proposed that objects emit energy in small discrete packets that he called quanta. And so a quantum of energy is the minimum energy required um, for an atom to gain or lose any energy. So a quantum of energy is that minimum quantity that can be lost or gained by an atom. And he proposed the following relationship, that E, energy, is equal to some constant, which later became Planck's constant, named after him, times frequency, nu. So E equals H nu. And this frequency is the same frequency that we just learned about when we were talking about waves. So the energy of an individual photon, he said, is directly proportional to its frequency. And E is energy. And then H is Planck's constant, which I'll get to in a minute, and nu is frequency. And the greater the frequency, the greater the energy. So the greater the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, the greater the energy. So um, around this same time, Einstein expanded Planck's theory by introducing the idea that electromagnetic radiation has a dual wave particle nature. So remember we first looked at waves and talked about wave properties and then we said that Planck said that no, 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 light really is made up of particles called these photons of energy. And then Albert Einstein expanded this and said well it turns out that both theories are correct. That electromagnetic radiation can act like a wave and it can act like a particle. 
And so he considered light a stream of these particles, so a wave-like stream of particles that he referred to as photons, which are short for photoelectrons. A photon is defined as a particle of electromagnetic radiation that has zero mass and carries a quantum of energy. So the photoelectric effect was first observed, I want to say in the late 1800s, like the 1880s, and it refers to the emission of electrons from the surface of a metal when light shines on the metal. So if you shine light on a sheet of metal, you could eventually get that sheet of metal to spew electrons and you see light emit from it. And it was determined that it takes a specific frequency of light to make any given metal eject these photoelectrons. So the wave model predicts that light of any frequency should cause this to happen. So there was a lot of uh, consternation about why this happened. If you took a sheet of metal and shone light on it, it would only spew light, show electrons coming out of it, when a specific wavelength of light uh, hit it. So this photoelectric effect, again, incoming light comes in, hits a metal, and the metal can be any metal. It was observed with copper and zinc and all different kinds of metal. What happens is, as you go through different frequencies of light, eventually you hit the right frequency of light, and all of a sudden you'll start to see this sheet of metal spew electrons. So Einstein was able to explain the photoelectric effect, and in fact that was one of his uh, first uh, papers that he wrote and what he eventually uh, won a Nobel, pri a Nobel Prize for um, explaining the photoelectric effect. So what he said is that electromagnetic radiation is absorbed by matter in whole numbers of photons. And in order for an electron to be ejected from the surface of the metal, it must be struck by the photon that has that minimum energy required to knock it loose. So the energy of that photon is still described by the equation E equals H, which is Planck's constant, times nu, which is the frequency.